So kia ora koutoko, Victoria McLennan and Toko Unwara, and welcome to this webinar where I'm going to have our last fireside chat for the year of 2022, the lovely Anne-Marie Kavanagh, who's the Deputy Chief Government Digital Officer. For everyone who's um, here watching this, welcome and thank you. We have a Q&A function today, so if you have any questions for Anne-Marie, then um, whenever they come to mind, please raise them and I'll go through a few kind of curated discussion questions with her and then start um, posing your questions to her as, as we go. So over to you, Emery. why don't you introduce yourself to the people watching today? Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Amari Kavana Toko Ingoa. So uh, as Vic has outlined, uh, my role is Deputy Chief Executive at Te Tarikai Whanua, uh, Department of Internal Affairs, and also Deputy Government Chief Digital Officer. So uh, I think I have two of the longest titles in, in the public sector, um, but I'm really delighted to be here today um, to talk to you, Vic, uh, and ITP professionals, um, really about some of the work that we're doing. So. Um, yeah, we squeezed it in, Vic, right at the end of the year, but I'm um, super happy to be here um, and that we managed to get a date in the calendar. So, um, yeah, that's me and happy to, to kind of kick into questions and, and see where we go. Awesome. Yeah, getting between our two crazy calendars, it was really hard, <laughs> but I think it's really fitting that here we are the Friday before Christmas, a, a week to go, and we can do a bit of a reflection of this year and start talking about looking forward to next year. So one of the harder questions to ask you first, I guess, is we're coming to the end of 2022. Some of us um, say it's been a really hard year after two challenging years with COVID lockdowns and the impacts of those. Generally speaking, what's your assessment of the year from a government digital delivery perspective? So overall, I think we've done really well. Um, we've had some standout work um, produced um, happy to talk through uh, the course of the next hour, some of our priorities. Um, but some of the standouts for us have been the launch of the Digital Strategy for Aotearoa. Um, so that was launched in September. Um, it was a piece of work that um, had taken a while to come to fruition, but as all good things, uh, sometimes good things take a little bit of time. Um, and I'm really pleased with that work for a number of reasons. Um, I think first and foremost, um, the fact that it really represents an opportunity for Aotearoa, um, particularly around the digital economy and kind of sets out um, some of the priorities and, and pillars, certainly that the minister is, is looking to support. So uh, for those people who haven't seen the strategy, um, it's worth taking a look. And there's, there's three pillars, um, inclusion, um, and trust um, and growth. So for us, it was a really neat opportunity as officials to start to really think about the opportunities around um, the digital economy for New Zealand. And for me personally, that's a little bit broader than my normal day to day. So as Deputy Government Chief Digital Officer, um, I lead a team of 150 people um, that uh, support the digital public service branch uh, here at Tari Tai Whanua. And our normal swim lane is really supporting government transformation, working with agencies. And so for me, the reason why I kind of look to the digital strategy for Aotearoa, it was a really neat opportunity to see how GovTech can support the broader econo economy, um, but also more broadly to work in an integrated fashion with colleagues from MB, uh, DPMC, so Department, Prime Minister and Cabinet, um, Stats and ourselves to really think a little bit more broadly around the opportunities for Aotearoa around um, digital. Um, and, and so for me, that was a really awesome piece of mahi, I think, that, that we did together. Um, but the other reason why I, I kind of think on, on, on that piece of work is the fact that we also published it in a range of formats. Um, so we were quite bold, I think, as we worked our way through the engagement process. Um, the minister gave us a challenge, um, which was to make sure that while we were thinking around digital, we didn't leave people behind. So, you know, the engagement process, we, we thought quite carefully how we didn't exclude um, groups and individuals who wanted to, to contribute to the strategy. And when it was finally published, it was published in um, English, um, Tereo, um, Braille, um, and so there was a number of formats, including easy read format. So it was just an, an awesome piece of work that we really worked across the public sector, um, but really kind of reflected some of the values. I think that the minister really wanted to see 
um, come through, particularly the public engagement. So yeah, that was kind of one 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 standout for me. Um, mm. And then there's the normal work that we have around the strategy for digital public service. But um, yeah, I think for me it was the digital strategy for Oh, it's really it's really good to have something to coalesce around as well. And for sitting outside of government, it's good to have something to to draw some common language around. So I'm really pleased that that strategy is complete and we're able to start executing some activity below it. And I'm sure you are as well. But yeah. thinking about the other things that have happened this year, what else has gone well and what are you proud of? <laughs> um, proud of um, my first and foremost, proud of my team. Um, it's, been a, it's been an interesting year. Um, but we've delivered not only the digital strategy for Aotearoa, um, but also we've been looking at the action plan for the strategy for digital public service. Um, we've also looked at some of the big initiatives that we have a group called the Digital Government Leadership um, Group, which is a cohort of around 13 CEs across the public sector. Um, and we've really, um, you know, the word that you just used, coalesced, you know, we've been really deliberate in our strategy over the last couple of years around carving out some of the priorities for ourselves. Um, so digital identity, um, digital inclusion, um, digital investment. I'm happy to talk about individually those um, during the course of, of the next wee while. Um, but all of that has taken effort. And so I'm, I'm really proud of my team um, because 2022 has been a difficult year. You know, um, we started at the beginning of the year, we, we had a conversation earlier in the week in the office around how the year started. and you know, we all came back out of 2021 thinking 2022 is going to be a lot easier. We're out of lockdowns, you know, we've had, uh, we're coming out the other side. But on reflection, it's been pretty challenging. Um, you know, we've had COVID in communities, it's affected the workforce, it's affected my team, um, you know, and you start to see the impact on um, team members and the Fano and you know, we've kept going and, and I'm really proud of the fact that we've been able to continue um, the mahi and continue delivery um, and if I think back to you know even how we started the year when you know I remember when we had to send people home because we had the protests outside um, it's been a really interesting and challenging year but mm. the team have come through it um, and, and looking around uh, now over the last few weeks you can really see how they've dug deep and, and continue to deliver um, with professionalism so yeah I'm, I'm really proud of them. Well, that's great. And it's good to be proud of the people around you, right? <laughs> so to the inevitable other side of the coin, what hasn't gone so well this year, do you think? Um, I think for me, what hasn't gone, I wouldn't say not gone well, things that you'd like to go better, faster, quicker. I think that's all my, always my challenge. It's always my challenge in government. Um, I've been in the public sector now for six years. Um, prior to that, I was in the private sector. Um, so I wouldn't say things haven't gone well, but I'm always, I'm always anxious for pace and I'm always looking for things to happen more quickly, you know? And so um, for me, there's been some projects where, you know, we've carved out time, we want to see progress, but sometimes the inevitable, whether it's machinery of government, um, or volume of of of, um, of work has just delayed. So there's been some areas where you say, "Gosh, I wish we'd you know, I wish we got that done quicker." But given the year that we've had around, you know, as I, as I talked about earlier, you know, COVID and um, volume, I, I think we've done pretty well. Um, but for me, I'm always anxious, and I think Vic, you know me, I'm always looking for pace and how can we do things quicker. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll yeah. dig into that a little bit more in a second. I just want to point out to everyone who's watching, I am not drinking wine. We are, I don't know if you can see this, I realise I just had a sip of water and you would have all seen I'm drinking it out of a wine glass, but it's definitely water. Um, we are moving out of, ITP is leaving this office after about 20 years of being here. And, um, and it is kind of our last day of working here in the office. So it's really lovely to be doing this, this podcast while, while, um, or this webinar while working in the office for the last day. But we've sold everything or given it away and we've got no glasses left. So I'm <laughs> left drinking my wine out of it, my water out of a leftover wine glass. So just letting you all know. Yeah. Um, Right, so digging into that a little bit more about pace. So the digital technology space is really um, rapidly evolving and change is constant. 
And one of the criticisms of the government mm. is your pace, that it can be mm. glacial and that you're not responding fast enough. Do you think that's fair? Um, no, I don't think it's fair at times, and, and I'll, I'll dig into why. I think my observation, having worked in the private sector, um, in digital and digital transformation, um, working for a private sector organisation, um, you're very clear on um, benefits, clear on target audience, clear on how you want to engage, but the context of digital government is very different. Um, you can't leave people behind. Um, you're thinking about everybody, um, the sum of the whole. Um, there's much more complexity around um, ensuring that some of the um, priority programs um, meet the needs of New Zealanders. And that's a huge scope. Um, and so, you know, I think the thing that I've come to appreciate is there's tension there, but actually I think you know, within the public sector, our context is just that little bit different, um, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, you come in and I know there's been a couple of projects, not this year, previous years, where we said, right, we're going to do a 12 week sprint. Um, we're going to work in agile, we're going to think about how we do it. Um, and that can present huge problems. Um, it can present huge problems around engagement um, and it can present huge problems around engaging with certain parts of communities when trust actually is the most important thing. So one of the lessons and one of the observations, I guess, that I've learned working in um, digital government, which is very different from the private sector, we can only work at the speed of trust, which sounds a bit of a cliche, but actually we need to consider that. Um, we need to think about how we get the trust and confidence um, and we actually truly engage um, to make sure that the services and that the outcomes are delivered appropriately and correctly for the context in which we operate so it probably sounds a little bit of a long wordy answer but the mm. context for me around digital government is so different sometimes from the private sector and I think one of the observations I've made this year is certainly your office trying to improve the way you're engaging in the digital equity space so another hat that I wear as co-chair of DECA the digital equity coalition Aotearoa and we've certainly had some really positive engagements where we can bring a community voice and not necessarily the loudest voices, often the people that are so busy head down doing their yeah. mahi that they don't have opportunities to engage with government. And we've been able to bring that voice collectively um, to a government forum in a way that hasn't happened before. Do you mm -hmm. think that there's... Um, an opportunity to overcome the perception by private sector or industry that government is glacial and times it moving to use that same kind of technique or tactic for improving just that engagement with with the private sector do you think that's a model you might explore yeah absolutely and I think it also goes down to our approach around communicating the function and the role and the purpose of the GCDO so I probably glossed over that very early on in the intro so um, for those people who aren't aware the, the government chief digital officer um, role is a function it's what we call a system lead um, that has been um, designated by the public service commissioner um, the government chief digital officer role is held by Paul James who's the chief executive of Te Tare Tai Whenua and Department of Internal Affairs and, and my role is to um, support him in that function and a system leader role means that you you have the verticals of agencies so whether it's to fat order you know New Zealand health um, whether it's MB um, whether it's um, IRD you know we are there to work across the horizontal and the horizontal for us is 37 uh, departments um, crown entities and so we we kind of have a system view and and I think that's where we could do probably a stronger job of communicating our role, form and function. Um, and then with that comes a set of, um, I, I guess, a set of levers that we, we hold, but there's also a set of levers that we don't hold. So each agency is responsible for their own digital transformation. And, and our role is to really help coordinate um, and provide coherence and to provide direction. Ultimately, it's up to agencies to decide where they invest. So the context for us is, is very different. Um, and that could sometimes lead to a perception of pace, um, but it's really having an appreciation of what, where and what we can step into um, and how fast we can go um, can, can ultimately be impacted by that unique 
um, landscape um, that, that we operate in. One of the questions from one of our, our viewers is, is your role as Deputy Government Digital Officer or Chief Government Digital Officer a part-time one or is it a full-time role? Like, is that the only thing you do or do you do other things? Um, it's my full-time role. Um, so it is my full-time role. Um, so there's always, like inevitably in many organisations, there's always, could you just? Um, so there's always, could you just also? Um, so I'll give an example. So um, I sit on the Operations Career Board for the public sector. Um, so that's kind of, a, you know, an on top. Um, and then there's various governance committees that I sit in. But my day to day, 100 um, percent, if not more, is is the digital government um, role. And then talking about the size of your organisation, you said about 150 staff. There's quite a commitment to this space from the government. Do you think that's consistent or proportionate with with what is needed? Um, I think. This is going to probably sound a very, um, for the context in which we operate, um, mm. yes. Um, I think there's always work that we could do to um, sharpen up some of our um, levers. So be clear around direction, be clear around expectations. Um, but then there's the inevitable pieces of work that can come our way that enables us to scale up and scale down. So if I think about digital identity last year, um, we had a piece of work, we had some ring fence funding, we had a dedicated team, we scaled up and then we scaled back. So. I think given the context within we within which we operate, yes, it's always easy to say we need more people. But I'm always very cautious that if we take that approach, we need to be clear around what we're delivering for who and when and how. Um, you know, I think it's um, it's always very um, appropriate for us as the public service department to be very clear around what we're funded for um, and not to um, overstep. Um, and increase mm. our workforce without having that very clear priority and focus around what we're doing and what we're not doing and what we can actually deliver. And that's always been that tension and challenge and the expectation of citizens and industry. And it's really hard balance to strike, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And some of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years here is thinking about where's the strongest levers that we have um, to actually start to um, encourage, guide, um, direct a little bit more agency. So, you know, we're always thinking of ways within the machinery of government that we can um, get a little bit sharper um, around our expectations. Um, there's always the tension around telling agencies what to do. Um, we don't tend to operate in that space. Sometimes we may need to give direction, um, but we, we have been thinking really carefully around form and function. Um, of the team and size um, and it's just something I'm really conscious that we try and get that balance right. Well just a couple more things before we move on to talking about what's exciting and what's coming next. Um, <laughs> everyone who's wa who's watching this works in the digital technology industry and so are really interested in what the biggest opportunities for the digital technology industry might be that that you see might come out of the digital strategy and the and the um, certainly in the growth po the digital technology industry transformation plan. Um, mm. Do you do you have any kind of highlights that you think we could be looking forward to as industry that will come from that? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably limit it to some of the the work that's more within mm. our, our remit, if that's okay, Vic. Um, yeah, I think for me the the exciting opportunities for us next year. Um, as, as you may know, and I don't know if your members know, but we've bought the Sophia license. Um, I'm actually really excited about the opportunity for that for the public sector, um, trying to get some consistency guidance standards, um, but also trying to hopefully kick into some work in the new year around what's the workforce that we need. Um, we know that some of the work that we've been doing through the investment um, mandates um, that we have at the GCDO is you know, we're getting a clear review from agencies about where they want to invest around digital. Um, we're getting a clear review around um, what um, fiscally is, a, you know, hopefully what the outlook will look like. And, and so we've been thinking very carefully around um, what does that, how does that interplay between investment and workforce structure look like? Um, we don't have a formal mandate, but I'm really excited um, to think next year around how can we really unpack a little bit more around the skills that we need within the public sector. And I know you and I, Vic, have talked a couple of times around what does that mean from a chief executive level all the way through in the organisation? 
um, I would love that piece of work um, to really come to fruition next year and that we start to build a clear review um, around the requirements and, and what we need to do and also the opportunity. Um, when I came into the role a couple of years ago, um, I saw an opportunity around some of the work that we do in investment um, and also some of the, the scale of investments that we have um, within the public sector around digital transformation. If we have the opportunity to be able sig to signal um, to the private sector, these are the areas that government, government is looking to invest in. Um, I think that has an additional benefit, um, an additional um, uplift, certainly in, in, in the kind of economic profile um, for the digital, um, you know, for the digital economy. Well, we have a question that kind of dovetails nicely into that from Ross that says, if we see opportunities that strongly align with the strategy, what's the best way to highlight them and get support for them from your team? So it's a challenging one, isn't it? <laughs> well, well, I was going to say, I'll ask the question around, it depends on the project, right? Like it's, it always comes to scope. Um, is it something that would be in scope for uh, the GCDO? Or is it something that is MB? And, and this is the nuance that we have around mm. the digital strategy for Aotearoa. Um, some of those um, initiatives cross a couple of agencies. So um, always up for a conversation um, and it depends on, on the project. Maybe one of the ways that we could do this is through the joint tech leaders forum meetings that we have with you every mm. two months, is it? Where um, Graham Muller from NZ Tech and I meet with DIA and MB and we talk about everything that's going on. And so maybe one of the ways could be um, people who are members of ITP and NZ Tech channel those via Graham and I, and we can raise them. And then we can bring that back to, to the individual or the organization and say, yeah, that's actually something you need to talk to MB about, and here's a contact, or that's something that you need to talk to GCDO about, and here's a contact. Yeah. Would that be a good idea? Yeah, that'd be awesome. I think that's a really neat mechanism. Yeah, that would, that would hmm. be good. Yeah kind of gives us a framework to work in so that you're not having to answer emails from every single person who's watching this That's um, right. <laughs> yeah. over the holidays when they all have great ideas which all will all be great ideas um so let's talk about looking forward to 2023 20, and you've talked a little bit about Sophia what else yeah. are your team going to be focusing on next year yeah so a couple of other um big areas for us um digital identity trust framework um that was actually started uh, last week. We're waiting for the third reading and um, then the committee the whole. Um, that has been a piece of um, mahi that the GCDO has held um, for a few years. Um, and now we're just waiting for the slot um, for, the, for the final reading. Um, that for me is exciting. Um, we need to think about the implications um, and unpacking that. And, you know, when I talked earlier around, you know, what, what I was most proud of in my team, there's a couple of team members there who have worked tirelessly on that for the last few years. And it's it's just so amazing to see it finally coming potentially to fruition. So we need to see how that progresses through the house and um, hopefully um, in the new year. Um, so that would be something that I'm, I'm looking forward to because it really has been, you know, if I think back probably four or five years work in the making um, and it would be great to, to really see that land. Um, I think the, the other opportunity is building on um, some of the work that we were doing around digital inclusion, um, seeing, seeing some of that um, get momentum um, with agencies. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will see more progress and certainly, um, you know, the, the direction um, that we've been giving to agencies. As I talked about the digital strategy for Aotearoa, you know, we are making a, a very strong effort and we are uh, hopefully agencies will see, you know, the fact that we are publishing um, our documents in multiple languages, you know, we're thinking about inclusion, we're thinking about how we can continue to engage um, differently um, to make sure that people um, and New Zealanders are not left behind. Um, I'm, I'm really keen to see that um, continue and, and gain momentum. And then I think the final piece um, would be around some of the investment work um, that we have um, been working on. Um, so if I explain the context a, a little bit more around that work, mm. um, around four years ago, um, Minister of Finance um, asked GCDO to look at some of the agency um, intentions around investment um, and to work alongside Treasury to um, understand where agencies were planning to invest. 
um, and then also looking at how we could um, prioritise um, and give some guidance over where ministers should or could be investing. Obviously not, uh, you know, that they're the decision makers, but giving some advice. And that piece of work has really evolved over the last few years where um, we have built up a comprehensive view. Um, we could see through COVID um, the, um, I want to say uptick, but the exponential increase uh, of agencies to, to invest in digital. Um, and I think we saw um, at the end of last year, um, agency intentions go from around 8 billion to 12 billion. Um, and so that's a significant increase. Um, and when you couple that with some of the work that we talked about earlier around, you know, capability and capacity of the market, how do we build um, economic growth? But how can we have confidence in delivery? And um, that's led to the GCDO and um, being given a what we call a stronger investment mandate, um, which came earlier in the year that we can also start to direct agencies a little bit more around you must invest. Um, and that's also been coupled with some of the challenges that we've seen around legacy. Um, and risk and obviously the, the evolving landscape around cyber. So for us, there's an exciting opportunity around how we can really um, work alongside agencies, but also give ministers um, a little bit more advice around where and how and how can we get, um, you know, we talk about how can we get, uh, how can we spend the crown, the crown dollar once to best effect um, instead of having multiple agencies going out and procuring uh their own system services you know um so there's huge opportunity for there to dig into and look at how we can coordinate and provide a more hopefully coherent plan around um government investment in in um, digital transformation so there are a couple of questions from viewers about investment um one of them is with the new infrastructure commission and their increased mm -hmm. focus on investment Will you be collaborating with them on the investment management pipeline? Uh, yes, we do. Um, so um, as part of the new investment work, um, I've set up a group in the Digital Public Service branch called the Digital Investment Office. Um, and so um, we work alongside colleagues from Treasury um, and Infocom um, around um, investment. So those opportunities are starting to come now. Um, and that's a piece of work that... Um, you know, we're really excited to to lean into um, and to think about how we can coordinate and collaborate um, a little bit better. And then the second question was similar, but around the relationship with the government property group. Is there a similar investment profile relationship there? Um, it's building. Um, we have probably been... Um, I want to say first cab off the ranks, but we've been probably leading perhaps a little bit more the work around thinking around a coordinated investment profile for digital. Um, we do work with the property group um, and that has been um, very much um, held at CE level. So um, there's the um, property group and we do work with them, but we also see opportunities for that in the future um, to think about how we could work collectively um, together. Um, my observation um, and comment is that that needs to be led by ministers as well. So, you know, mm -hmm. we, we obviously follow the priorities of ministers. Um, and so there are opportunities and we do engage regularly. Um, and we did see the opportunity, particularly through COVID, around how we can coalesce better around some of the all of government work. So how can we get agencies to work together, um, et cetera? Oh, cool. That's good answers. So. Getting back to talking about next year, what are you looking forward to the most in 2023? Um, God, that's a really good question. What am I looking forward to the most? Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to building on the momentum that we've had and we hope to continue. Um, certainly at the GCDO around some of those big priority items I, I talked about. Um, but I'm also seeing opportunities for us, particularly through that investment work, to engage at a higher, more strategic level. Um, so, you know, how can we influence um, some of the programmes of work? Um, for me, they're the, probably the biggest opportunities um, that I can see coming. Um, but it's probably just around, first and foremost, maintaining momentum. You know, we, we carved out a number of priorities um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and I'm seeing I'm seeing kind of the fruition of that, and I, I'd like to see that progress um, and and move forward. So 
you know, we don't have a crystal ball as to what will happen next year, but you know, I think I think we're we're fairly confident that we landed on some of the right priorities and we're just starting to see the fruition of that now. So let's talk about that a little bit. We're going into election year. We um we all know how disruptive that can be. Will that be on your list of things that you're looking forward to the least next year? <laughs> um, no, I, I wouldn't say that. I think, you know, uh, public servants, uh, we are politically neutral. Um, and I think, you know, it's something that we are conscious of. Um, change happens, but you, you have to, you know, you have to maintain um, some of the work programmes, some of the BAU activities. Um, it's it's part of the normal the normal role of being a, a public servant. You know, um, elections happen. Um, it's our role to support, um, and it's our role to um, certainly maintain continuity um, across mm. a couple of components. So, no, I think you know we, um, yeah, it will be the second third time I think that the group has been through change. So, yeah, it, it's it's normal part of being a public servant. Yeah. And even when the same government's returned, it's a change of government, right? Because you get new ministers and they and they often reprioritise. So no matter yeah. what an election creates, that kind of disruption. Yeah, yeah. It's um it's always a time to watch with interest, I think. Um it's also for me, um, I guess an interesting, it's been an interesting experience um coming into um Tabito Fano and Department of Internal Affairs because um, while not my group, but another group looks after the beehive and the executive and ministerial servicing. So you really see the machinery of government um, operate. Um, and so, you know, I kind of go, um, are we, I, don't, I can't remember how you phrased it, are we nervous? No, it's kind of normal part of machinery government. So it's actually, it's quite exciting to watch it unfold um, and, and to play a role in supporting, you know, and I probably go to that higher order of, you know, it's, it's, it, it, for me, it's been um, an awesome experience to work as part of the public sector and to be part of democracy. Um, you don't get that opportunity, you know, certainly in previous roles when I was in, in the private sector. Um, you get a very unique view um, of events. So, yeah. So before we go to the many more questions that are building up from people <laughs> watching, I've just got one more thing to ask you. So looping back to the beginning of our conversation, we talked about 2022 being the third tough year on the trot mm. after you know our two big lockdown years and then and lots of challenges in 2022, as you said. Do you think 2023 is going to be any different for, for us and our people? Um I'm the I'm the eternal optimist. So I say I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, I would hope that, you know, we start to see, um, we start to see us coming really out the other side of COVID. Um, you know, um, we have seen, particularly in the last few weeks, months, even with the mind team, you know, we've seen COVID coming back and people having COVID for the second time, uh, people who've not had it. Um, you know, we've seen that impact, we've seen the impact of, of turnover as well. We know that um, you know, those individuals with digital skills um, means there's high turnover in, in our part of the workforce. Um, I'm ever the optimist that um, that things will will settle down um, and that we start to really come out of the other side. So um, I, I hope 2023 will be um, a more, I don't know what the right word is, is it stable? Is it is it more um, mm. consistent? I would hope so, um, because you know, we know that a lot of New Zealanders are having a tough time. Um, so let's hope that, you know, we start to see, um, we start to see some settling. Yeah, that's, um, I, I am really, I think I observed to you earlier today when we were chatting, I'm really noticing this pent up excitement by people about pushing to the end of this year, having a holiday, yeah. and then 2023 being this whole new year, like people are, it, more so than I think I've ever heard before, the expectations for a great year are very high. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it feels like a year has flown by. We're in a very different position to where we were last year. Um, mm. But uh, I would hope so, and I hope we all get great weather. Um, and, you know, we can talk about how humid it is in Wellington at the moment. Let's hope we all get some <laughs> weather. And, um, and we really... 
we really don't get humidity here and it's a tiny bit humid for people around the country and we're all complaining so we feel for everyone in Auckland, East Cape, far north where you get real humidity definitely. Hey um, there's a couple of suggestions from people I'll just let you know one was that um, from a system influence perspective you could be influencing um, teachers wages particularly in the in the vocational education and higher education space where there's some inequities there so there's there's a there's an opportunity for you there's also a suggestion that you could have a, um, a portal for tech ideas and tech queries mm -hmm. so that like a um, here's the the front door into your agency for people to give you all their wonderful suggestions yep. take that one um yep. <laughs> take that one how you'd like yep. but getting on to the questions a question from um from mark which is something that that we haven't heard much coming from your office about recently which is the d7 the digital seven nations group or are they oh, the yep. digital nine now is it grown <laughs> again it, it, i can't remember it's now digital um, nations yeah oh is, it, is that what it is don't put a number yeah so the question is how how much engagement your team has with that mm. kind of international group mm. and how informed the digital strategy for Aotearoa was by the mm. the collective um works okay that's an awesome question and thank you mark for that question <laughs> um so if I back up a couple of years when I came in GCDO, um, there was a lot of work that took place internationally, um, you know, D7, D9, which is now Digital Nations, uh, there was OECD work, uh, there was talk of um, DGX, which is a, a collaboration forum run out of Singapore. Um, observation was that, um, well, my observation at the time was there was a lot happening on the international front, but actually there was a few burning platforms um, domestically um, that we had to work alongside agencies on, um, which has kind of led to this journey that we've been on around investment, where we see risk, um, uplifting capability. So um, we scaled back um, some of our work on the international front, um, and that was done purposely because um, I know having come out of the Ministry of Health, um, agencies need support and they need guidance. Um, and so it's great to have the international um, collaboration, but we needed to just scale a little bit back so that we could focus. And it's of no criticism to, to, to um, you know, previous iterations, the context had changed, um, I think, with the publication of the strategy for digital public service. So as if I go back to this year, um, we do still work alongside Digital Nations um, and we do still work within um, the GGX. So that's the, the collaboration I talked about within Singapore. And what I've observed over the last couple of years is um, Particularly through COVID, um, the conversations internationally um, two years ago, even three years ago in that first year of COVID were very much around technology platforms, technology plays, um, you know, how could you operate at scale, all the normal conversations that you'd expect. Um, and for when I, when I went to the, to the meetings and Paul, um, who's the, the GCDO and CEO of, of Saitavana, we had an observation that New Zealand we did contribute to those tech conversations, but we had a unique view, um, which comes through in our strategies, which is we were probably one of the few jurisdictions that were um, weaving through those tech conversations, the narrative around trust and the narrative around inclusion. Um, and I think that's something that is so uniquely Aotearoa and stems from the context of the, of the treaty, um, partnership, trust, inclusion, values and behaviours that um, other jurisdictions didn't necessarily go to first and foremost. And so we kind of had this observation through COVID that we seem to be one of the few jurisdictions that were, you know, in fact, you know, some of these initiatives around how Ministry of Education, mm -hmm. you know, gave out equipment, you know, there was um, the ability for, um, for agencies to really help support people through the pandemic. Um, other jurisdictions didn't quite focus in the same way, they were talking about, you know, the apps, the Bluetooth, and, and so this is a very long-winded response, apologies Mark for your answer, but what we have now seen two years is all those jurisdictions are now suddenly talking about inclusion, they're talking about trust, they're talking about not leaving people behind, they see the challenge around trying to reach communities um, through a tech approach alone, um, and so for me the Digital Nations has been a fantastic opportunity, but we've also seen 
our narrative be influenced um, by other jurisdictions, particularly around some of the opportunities around cloud, but more importantly, we've actually contributed, I think, a little bit, and we've seen some of the values that we have within uh, New Zealand Aotearoa be reflected back in, in other countries' um, uh, nice. plans and strategies, and that's been a really, really awesome thing, and, and that, that mm. I think has been one of the things through the digital strategy of Aotearoa that we've been really proud to maintain. Nice. Well, sticking with the international relationships theme, Keitha asked a question about the Open Government Partnership. Yeah. And her, her question is, what are, what are your plans for DIA to deliver the new draft Open Government Partnership Commitment 3 to establish an integrated multi-channel approach to public services? Great question. Great question, isn't it? From <laughs> no, yeah. I'm probably going to give a really watch this space answer <laughs> because um, that's a piece of work that we have uh, just been scoping, um, and we've we're almost at the stage of what I call a plan for a plan. Um, so the team here at uh, DPS um, have been looking at that plan, um, and it's something that we are currently scoping. But we will come out early in the new year um, with an engagement approach um as to how we really build build out um that commitment three um so it was a piece of work um that came to us a couple of weeks ago so we're, we're really at very early stages of forming so i hate to say watch this space um but Vic, it's probably an opportunity for us to come back and and have a, a, yeah. a further discussion well it's also fair to say there are some questions in here i'm not going to ask in this kind of public forum because they're very specific about specific projects and and agencies and some procurement questions and i'll pass okay. those to you to, to yeah. channel back answers that we can pass back would be great okay. um i am going to ask you next questions from kay who is very good at always championing digital accessibility in these yes. forums and she just had a question about well, the, is, are there any plans to progress all of government's digital accessibility beyond websites? For example, standards for digital documents, emails, um, and she said providing alternatives to unreadable PDFs would be a great start. Yep. So is accessibility on the agenda? Yes, it is. Uh, and K, if it's the same K, and I have a feeling it, it is. Will you, be. Asked, you asked me a question once in Auckland um, about um, having people join the team um, with the right skill set and um, really coming from um, the community um, and that's something that I took on board and we do have someone in, in my group um, who has low vision um, so he joined us I think about 10 months ago um, and some of the work Kay, that we've been really leaning into is looking at some of those um, accessibility formats so it's part of the work program that I'm really looking forward to the team framing up um, next year. Um, you, talked about the, the digital strategy for Aotearoa but I also see an opportunity that actually through some of that work around investment you know can we get to a point where we say to agencies you must you must invest you must invest in your website you must provide you must meet the standards um, and so that's kind of some of the levers that we're probably hoping to uh, I wouldn't say softly deploy but deploy a little bit more more in the next couple of years um, we have those opportunities now in front of us it's the how and where do we tackle first um, and how do we really move forward on that? Excellent. Good to know. I'm sure Kay will ask you in future forums how that's <laughs> progressing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, something really topical, question from Alan, the Digital Council was wound up yesterday. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk about that at all? Um, and I guess the key thing he's asking about is there is no external advice to mm. ministers now with winding up the digital council and so are there any plans to replace that with something else that you know of or ways of getting external device into the system um so yes the digital council announcement went out yesterday um the um the sense is that the context had changed um and i think you know with the release of the uh the digital strategy for Aotearoa, um, the context had changed for the council. Um, and I think the council had done some excellent work over the last couple of years. Um, but I think, you know, as the minister signalled um, in the release, the context has changed. And I think he's looking for um, different opportunities um, to think about the next areas of advice that he's probably looking for from 
an independent perspective. Um, I think I'd say watch the space again for next year around, around where they are. Um, and Vic, you, you know this, I think um, the minister has really valued um, having that independent voice. Um, and I, I suspect if he was on the call today, um, he would be saying about channeling him, he'd be saying he really values the independent voice. He recognises the tension and it's a good tension between um, advice that comes from the private sector and advice from officials. Um, and he recognises the differences um, around, you know, the advice that we will give him may be a little bit different. Um, it may be around machinery of government, but he really values that independent view. So I would say, let's see what happens early in the new year and, and see where, where he wants to take um, the next iteration. Yeah, I, I definitely um, agree with you on that point. Recently, in a series of meetings with him and other ministers, um, when we were, a group of us were advocating pretty heavily for the extension of the equitable digital access um, funding to continue paying for the connectivity for 21,000 families, which thank you to the efforts of DIA and, and Ministry of Education, that, that has been extended. Um, one of the meetings, through, and you know, Minister Crack must have been sick of seeing me over a period of a couple of weeks, but one of the meetings I threw, I flew, um, I, I flew fabulous community people from around the country, uh, Māori and Pacifica, who work at the grassroots in their local communities to come and meet him. And I hadn't really realised the gravitas for them because, you know, their first time in the beehive and, and all of that side of it and then every time I've seen him since which is only a few weeks ago he just says how great it was to get that direct feedback mm. from the people on the ground of what they're seeing and experiencing and um and I just hope other ministers and whoever the future minister in this space is will value have that same level of value of getting that very direct feedback yeah, yeah. very important yeah absolutely and I think you know he, he's right to call out the difference, but it's awesome that he also recognises the difference in advice um, and that, you know, he he does recognise that the advice can come from two very different perspectives. Um, but, you know, when you take them together, I think there's huge opportunity. So, um, you know, I, I would expect there will be something who what, what that looks like, the form and function. Um, we don't have a formal view yet, but I would say probably something that will come in the new year. Awesome. Now, there's two big themes, I guess, to cover for our last couple of um, questions. Um, one is around procurement, the topic that you and I speak on <laughs> on a very regular basis. And the other is a little more about trust. So we'll tackle procurement first. There's quite a few questions here about specifics around procurement, but there's there's a question from Christopher around how can we grow the domestic IT industry given the procurement com constraints that, mm. that still exist for us. Can you talk a little bit to what the marketplace has done this year to really mm. help start transforming the procurement context? Yeah. Um, so for us, marketplace is a key channel um, and it's a key channel um, for us to engage with the market, but also to um, provide a set of services that agencies can consume. Um, it's been a really interesting journey for us with Marketplace. Um, I think at the moment we've got around 118 agencies, 120, 118, um, that use Marketplace services. Um, and we've got over, I think, a thousand listings um, on Marketplace. So we certainly see that as a vehicle um, and as a channel um, to really enable government procurement. Um, I think approximately there is around, um, there's over 5 million spend per month, but it's a channel that we'd like to really explore. Um, and the, the reason for us is we think that there's huge value um, in Marketplace for cost avoidance. Um, you know, how can we facilitate and smooth out procurement? Um, so we've seen strong growth in marketplace um, and the team have done a great job. There's always opportunities for improvement without doubt. So, you know, um, how, how agencies can um, consume services, how organisations can get listed on marketplace, always up. But we've really seen um, a strong uptick. So for us, that's a channel that we see of, of huge importance. 
Um, and Vic, you and I have had conversations around the visibility of spend. It's another reason why we like it. Um, we can see where the spend um, is taking place and then we can provide reporting that's um, transparent. And different procurement mechanisms sometimes provide complexity, um, you know, what's published out and gets, but with Marketplace, um, we've really seen the value. Um, so that's a, a channel that we would probably want um, to continue. Um, and then more broadly around kind of all of government services um, and some of the consumption of services, um, Jane Kennedy and my team, you know, there's some big pieces of work underway um, to look at some of the um, big services that we provide across government. Um, so there's a couple of reviews that are underway um, in, for example, IAAS and, and TAS space. Um, but more broadly, the opportunity, and again, I kind of go back to that investment mandate, one of the real opportunities that we see around having an, a deeper understanding of where agencies are planning to invest is that we can provide all the government services that are of value and that we know ahead of time um, that we can have a set of um, services that are procured appropriately and easily um, that actually meet the needs of, of both agencies but also add um, economically um, within New Zealand. So we, we kind of loosely talk around it kind of what would the digital architecture be look like? So, um, you know, do we need 23 agencies going out to procure um, HR or payroll systems or 43 agencies going out? <laughs> Probably not. There's ways to optimise um, and there's ways to think differently around the value proposition. And you know that I've long, I've long been a critic of the duplication of procurement teams across government agencies and um, and how they all interpret the rules of government, you know, rules of procurement differently and you get yeah. a different experience. So yeah. the, the wonderful things that Lawrence's team are doing to try and resolve that tension um, is fantastic. I think the important thing we need to really keep our eye on the prize, which is where that question came from, is how is government as a buyer going to help help sustain and build a thriving digital technology industry yeah. um, and procurement has obviously been a friction point in there yeah. so as long as you keep that in mind we'll all be much yeah. happier so to the last thing I'll just um, there's a few questions about the trust po in the digital mm. strategy there's a question here from um, El Tahir which is what are the critical enablers of the trust theme of the digital strategy of Aotearoa and how will trust be measured? Now that <laughs> might be too detailed, you may not be able to answer that question, but yeah. can you just give us a flavor of the, you know, this is a really important yeah. part of the strategy. Yeah. Um, how, how will you, I guess the question is, how will you know that, um, <laughs> what are the success criteria? How will you know that, that you've achieved leading, leading us through this trust journey? Yeah, that's a great gnarly question for the last <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> that's worthy of a whole topic on its own. <laughs> it is, and there are many, uh, many people are interested in that and yeah. many very detailed questions that I'll be passing on that you can pass on to your team. <laughs> yeah, I'll make a start and then I probably would say it's worthy of a, of a whole webinar yeah. in itself. Okay. Um, trust, trust for us um, in the context for the GCDO, probably the leading enabler is the Digital Identity Trust Framework. Um, we see that as an enabler for many reasons. One, that New Zealanders um, can um, ensure that they're using services that are safe, secure and trusted. Um, we know who the organisations are. There's going to be an accreditation regime. So that would probably be from, if I'm going to be purely selfish around the GCDO and how we interpret trust, that's one angle. Um, and that's probably a big enabler that, that we can see on the horizon. Um, but we also see trust around um, trust in government digital services. And we certainly saw that through COVID. So, you know, did, did every community engage with government digital services? Probably not. And it could be for reasons of accessibility. It could be for reasons of, um, you know, engagement with that community that it's a service that they trust. So one of the examples that we ran through COVID was the Bluetooth trial with Tiarua, um, where we ran a trial with um, Tiarua um, around designing the service. So, you know, it raised questions for us around service design. Who's best to design that service? Is it best that it's done out of a government agency in Wellington? Or are there opportunities for communities to help contribute to that co-design? So, so trust can come through in, in that component as well for us. Um, can it, it can come through in terms of um, language translations. So 
could we, should we be producing more of our um, services in multi-language formats? Um, again, an element that we should build on and think about quite carefully. Um, I had a, a HUI, what we call a digital public service HUI in November and, and someone in the audience from an agency asked, well, can't you just mandate you need to publish in multiple languages? So of course we can mandate that, but we want to see action, right? We want to see things happen. So mm. we could immediately say, yes, by next year, we want to see every government website in however many languages we like, but we'd like confidence that it's going to be delivered on. So, you know, you can see how that tension can unfold. Um, and then the other component, probably if I was in um, a different agency, the trust component, if I perhaps was the government chief information security officer would be around cyber. You know, have we got trust and confidence in services? Um, have we, can we see that um, New Zealanders information is being used appropriately and, and not being, um, you know, being put at risk? And that goes across the public private sector. So trust has many different lenses. It just depends on the starting point. So yeah, that's probably my short answer. <laughs> Excellent. Well, as we're just in time for winding up. So thank you for that. And thank you, Emory, for your time today. For everyone who we didn't get to your questions, I will pass them to Emory and we'll channel answers back to you because they were in, often quite complex and a lot of detail. Um, I will take you up on having a trust webinar next year. You and some of your team can come along and we can explore yeah. trust during the year. That would be fantastic because it is such an underpinning um, issue. And it would be also great to bring you into some other discussions that our members are really interested in around mis and disinformation, around yeah. Yeah. globalization challenges. And there's a whole lot of areas, I'm sure, that that would be fantastic to get your voice as, as yeah. part of the discussion. Yeah. Um, wishing you and Marie a fabulous holiday and I hope you relax and all of your Christmas wishes come to fruition yeah. and everyone who's been watching this thank you for joining us and wishing you all a fabulous holiday and we'll be back with our fireside chats and other webinars in January so kaite anō.